Okay. Good morning. Welcome everybody to the course BC308. We're going to take a moment to pray together and then we're going to get started. Could somebody please lead us in prayer? Okay, Avni, you want to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Good morning. Thank you. Father God, we are so very thankful to you for a new morning, for your tender mercies, for your grace, for your abundant wisdom, Father, that you render your children, Father, for which we are here, Father. And as we are uh, as we are in your presence, Lord, lead us by your power, with your wisdom, and help us to understand, Lord Father, the word in a way that enriches us, builds us up for your glory, honor, and praise to be manifested on this earth as to be a salt and light on this earth, Father. And whatever we are learning, Father, may it build us up in your most holy faith, Father. Lead us through pastor, anoint him, Father, bless him with good health and long life. And for all the students and all those who would be hearing the lectures, that they would be utterly blessed by the word that has been released on us, Father, today. In Jesus' name, we give you glory, honor, and praise and ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. So we are going through the book of Revelation. We just started um, still in chapter one, and um, we are going to Revelation. Our goal is to go through it verse by verse, and um, I see what the Lord has given to us already concerning the end times and things yet to come. So we were actually in verses 4 and 5 of Revelation chapter 1. That's where we stopped last week. Um, the Lord Jesus is speaking to John through his angel, messenger, and he's giving a message right, right at that point. He's saying, John, speak to the seven churches which are in Asia. So what we said was that these seven churches were actually there at that time. And we should take them as the Lord's message to each one of those churches. He was observing them and he's giving them a message. However, when we read those messages, we can learn a lot for ourselves. Because if the Lord Jesus was evaluating or he was assessing or observing those churches, what was going on there, and he had something to tell them, then we can definitely learn from that. Just like, you know, all the other scriptures where, um, example, the Apostle Paul may be writing to the Corinthian church, or he may be writing to the church in Galatia, or, but through all of that, it is, while it is for them, it is also for us. So, it is very useful, and we are going to do that you know, as we go through chapters two and three. The only thing that the thing that we said we should not do is to say that each one of these seven churches represent, excuse me, represent seven dispensations or time periods, and then we say, okay, so we are right now in the seventh church period you know that, that that is not the correct way to you know interpret chapters two and three because these churches were there at that time they were actual churches they were jesus was not referring to time periods he was speaking to each one of those churches so you know sometimes you may hear some messages like that and uh, you just have to keep in mind that it's a misapplication of Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's, it's not right. That's not what the Lord intended. right? So we, we mentioned that. And then in verses 4 and 5, we saw there are three, three times the word from is used. The first time in verse 4, from him who was, who is, and was, and who is to come, God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. God the Holy Spirit, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. 
So that third from is God, the eternal word. So you in, in these two verses, we see the Godhead revealed to us. That means this is the Godhead speaking. Now think about this. The beginning, the first few verses, it's saying Jesus is speaking. Hmm? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave to John. But verse 4 and 5 is telling us it is the Godhead who is speaking. So what does that tell us? That when one person of the Godhead speaks, it is as good as the Godhead speaking. Right? They are perfect unity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Perfect unity. Right? So uh, if the Holy Spirit is saying, it's the same as the Father and the Lord Jesus saying, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of the Father. If the Father is speaking, it's the same as God the Son, God the Eternal Word, and God the Spirit speaking. Right? They're in perfect unity. The other thing, so we will start from, so all of that we said, you know, uh, till last week, we Moving forward from there. Now, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Look at the titles that Jesus is using for himself. Faithful witness. Firstborn from the dead. The ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Look at these three titles. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. The faithful witness. So the Lord Jesus is referring to, so it's very interesting. At this time of the revelation, the Lord Jesus is in his glorified state. Right? He is he has ascended to the Father, he is seated at the Father's right hand, he is in his eternal glory. And yet the things that were attributed to him during his earthly ministry are continued to ref be referenced to him. That means this eternal Son of God is now called the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God, or you know, other titles, the Son of Man, or so on. Those titles are there. And one of these titles is the faithful witness. When was he a faithful witness? While he walked on the earth. He bore witness to the Father and to that the Father has sent him. Right? So that same title is applied to the, the eternal son. Now he is in his glory, the faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? Were there people who were raised from the dead before Jesus? Answer is yes. In the Old Testament, there were people who were raised from the dead. In the New Testament, Jesus himself raised people from the dead. But all of them died again. They died later. So they are still yet to be resurrected. But Jesus Christ was the first one who was resurrected from the dead. He raised, was raised from the dead, never to die again. So in that sense, he is the firstborn or first begotten, firstborn from the dead. Now. There was a teaching that came out, again, this was part of the charismatic movement and so on. It came out, you know, uh, I think maybe in the 70s. Uh, you may hear it here and there. And the teaching was using, you know, the scripture and related scriptures that using the term firstborn. Uh, the teaching was Jesus, and it is wrong, right? I'm just telling you it's wrong. So uh, in case you hear that, you you know that you don't need to subscribe to it. But it was part of the charismatic movement. But the teaching was 
Jesus was the first born again man. And because it, they, they took this term, first born from the dead, and extrapolated it, saying, oh, he was the first born again man. So the, the inference that was made from that was, therefore, every born again person is equal to Christ. Now that can't be true because Christ, after he was born, raised from the dead, he went to the Father and in he received the eternal glory which he had laid aside before he became man. That means the Christ is eternally God, he is in his eternal glory cannot equate the born-again believer to the glorified Christ. Cannot do that. The glorified Christ is God. The born-again believer is not God. So just to, because, just because it says he's a firstborn from the dead and you know we are all going to be resurrected, it doesn't equate us. There's a big difference between the born-again believer and the glorified Christ. So, you know, we don't subscribe to that, you know, Jesus is the first born-again person, and uh, therefore all, all those who are born-again are equal to Christ. We don't, we don't subscribe to that. Do we understand it? Okay, that's just a side, side note. It's, I'm not, it's not the main message but i just wanted to keep you informed that you know, that kind of teaching came out it's died out now you don't hear too you don't you hear it too often every now and then you might hear it but just keep in mind there's a big difference between the born again believer and the glorified christ christ today is in his eternal glory he's omniscient he's omnipresent he's omnipotent so we can't use this phrase, he's the firstborn. It is true, he was the first person to be eternally resurrected, and we are going to be resurrected, but we can't you know, mix the two. Charles, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. I am inquiring about being firstborn, being born, first born again, and the... Uh, Rose again. Ah, those things are now, I don't know. Would you shed more light? First born again, and again, rose again. So, thank you. Maybe you will see how to handle it, but it is trying to, to make me not understand. Thank you. Mm. So, what so the see first born from the dead simply means he was the first person to be eternally resurrected from the dead never to die again right but there was a teaching that came out you know some, some decades back where they used this phrase firstborn from the dead incorrectly. It was a wrong way to use it. They used that phrase firstborn from the dead, saying, Oh, he was the first born again man. Right? And that's that's a wrong way to use it. I'm just saying it that's what the teaching was in those days. First born again man, because of the phrase first born from the dead. So the thought was he became sin like us, he died, and he was raised to a new life. Like how we, you know, Romans 6 says, we died, we were raised to a new life. So they kind of make that parallel, which is not intended by this phrase first born from the dead. 
So it's a wrong thing to say. But that's that was the teaching in those days. You know? And then they said, okay, if Christ is the first born again person, then all of us who are born again are equal to Christ. Which is wrong. We are, God has graced us, and in one sense, yes, we are sons and daughters of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. That is true. But just keep in mind that Christ is eternally God, and we are not, we are not, born again people are not God. That's what I was trying to explain. Is that clear, Charles? <laughs> it would keep coming slowly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If you if you if it's not clear, don't worry about it. It was just a side note. Uh, you know, in case you come across that teaching these days, it's not too. Don't hear it too often. But in case you know that, uh, okay, it's it's not right. Say your question, please. Uh, I'm sorry for pressing on this issue again. I I, I was just wondering. Another light could it be another light to see firstborn from the dead is um pertaining the fact that many of the saints of old Abraham, David, and the likes of them um uh, could no way enter into heaven until Jesus Christ um made an ascension with them over to heaven after his resurrection. I, I don't know if that's another way also to see it as first born from the dead um well what, what you said is true that is the old testament saints could not go to heaven until jesus christ the lord jesus christ rose up from the dead and he ascended and he took them up with him that is true um but the old testament saints um we they according to hebrews 11 they would not receive their full consummation of their resurrection with apart from the new testament saints so based on hebrews 11 we could say look they are yet to receive the glorified bodies So in that sense, their spirits have been taken with Jesus to heaven. Just in the same way that today when a believer dies, the believer spirit goes to be with Jesus in heaven. But we are all waiting, according to Romans 8, for the manifestation of the sons of God for the fullness so that we can then receive our resurrected body so it's it's a future thing and there will come a time first thessalonians chapter 4 first corinthians 15 when we will receive our resurrected bodies whereas christ is already in his glorified body so that's the difference but what you said is true he took they couldn't go to heaven un, until christ rose from the dead so that is true uh is that implied here um could be, but uh, I'm thinking more of the emphasis on being him being resurrected from the dead in the sense of receiving an eternally glorified body, and he will never, never taste death again, in that sense. Thank you, Pastor. Agreed. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham's question, in the light of this, who is the new creation born again in simple terms? So the word born again, John chapter 3, is simply to receive life from above. And it has to do with us human beings, not to Jesus Christ. So in simple terms, we human beings were dead in our spirit, in sin, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 17, we were, we were alienated from the life of God, so we were dead in our spirit. That's, that doesn't mean our spirit didn't exist. Our spirit existed, but it did not have the life of God. So we were dead in our spirit. 
then when we received Christ we received life from above we received the Zoe life of God so we were born from above born again or as John says first John 5 verse 1 we were born of God that's being born again simple terms okay all right fine so I didn't didn't want to can I spend too much time on this this is a side note let's pick up in verse 7 uh, verse 6 so this is who Jesus is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and he is ruler of all the kings of the earth so think think about this he's emphasizing there are leaders on the earth but Jesus is Lord over all of them verse 5 and what has he done for us he's loved us he's washed us in his blood and he's made us kings and priests to God threefold aspect of who he is threefold aspect of who we are or what he's done for us who he is faithful witness firstborn from the dead ruler of kings of the earth what has he done for us he has loved us he's washed us in his own blood he's made us kings and priests to God right so he's saying look he's writing to his people and he's saying people I want you to know I love you I have washed you in my blood and I've made you kings and priests so the Lord Jesus is recognizing his people now think about this in chapters 2 and 3 he's going to be correcting his people these seven churches but as he opens his address to these seven churches he's saying I loved you or I love you I have washed you I've made you kings and priests that's who you are but he still has some message of correction to six of the seven churches so understand that dynamic where he loves us we are washed in his blood we are kings and priests and yet he wants to perfect us right he's working in us as a church to perfect us and therefore he would speak to us the way he spoke and he would point out things that are not pleasing in his eyes as he did in six of the seven churches think about the terms kings and priests I'm just moving a little fast and now uh, I realize we're in the middle of or early March and we need to finish by end of April so um, oh yeah Simran your video is on you can turn it off if you want um, yeah think about the term kings and priests kings and priests as kings we represent God on earth as priests we represent the earth before heaven right we take the matters of the earth before God in heaven that's the priest you representing people before the father representing earth before heaven as kings we are representing heaven on earth you're representing the king who's ruler over all kings all all yeah who's ruler over all kings we are representing him here on earth to bring his kingdom you're not so we have this dual role as kings and priests and that is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself so he's made us kings and priests to his God and Father to whom be glory and dominion verse 7 so now he's saying look he's coming every eye will see him even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him even so amen now verse 7 parallels Zechariah Zechari chapter 12 verse 10 where it says that when Christ returns and this is at the end of the battle of Armageddon when he comes those who pierced him will see him and they will mourn right so Zechariah the prophet Zechariah Zechariah 12 10 wrote about the coming of the Lord at the end of the battle of Armageddon he will come 
he will pour God will pour out his spirit of grace and supplication on the people Christ will come and those who pierced him will see him meaning the very people the Jewish people they're gonna see him that's repeated here he, every eye will see him even those who pierced him so Revelation 1 7 is talking about Revelation 19 and at the end of the battle of Armageddon, Christ will come and all the armies of heaven with him and every eye will see him now how this is going to happen we don't know you say what do you mean well you can imagine you know the Bible says that Jesus is going to come and he's going to descend on the Mount of Olives which is a localized spot on this earth right coming on descending there are people all over the globe how are they going to see him every eye will see him how are they going to see him? we don't know it could be a supernatural act of God at that moment causing people to see him descend on the Mount of Olives uh, uh, in some way in order to fulfill the scripture but it says every eye will see him right? and those who pierced him all the tribes of the earth they will mourn that means they'll they'll be in such shock and there's going to be you know they're going to be grieved that they did not receive the message of Jesus Christ right? they'll mourn at that moment right so Revelation 1 7 is pointing to Revelation 19 which we will see that's what will happen at the end of the Battle of Armageddon now once again, Jesus introduces himself. He, you know, it's interesting to see all the titles Christ uses for himself. He says he is the Alpha and Omega. That means the beginning and the end. He is at the start and at the end at the same time. Now, that's interesting. What does that mean? It means he's standing outside time. And that's why he, is, he can be at the beginning and at the end. So always keep in mind, God is living in a realm that's outside time. And in his realm, he's, a, he's at the beginning and at the end at the same time. Time for us is linear. Okay, that means tomorrow is yet to come and day after tomorrow is yet to come and the future is way out there. But for God, he's outside time. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. So he's at the start of time and he's at the end of time at the same time. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who was, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. He's the eternally self-existent one. He always is, he always was, and he always will be the same one. Right? He doesn't change. He doesn't have to grow. He doesn't have to mature. He doesn't have to grow old. He's not increasing, neither is he decreasing. In other words, he's eternally the same. constant one he was he is he is to come the same one right so he's introducing himself in this manner verse 9 so let's read I think we read till verse 8 so let's pick up from verse 9 let's read through verse 20 so Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 to 20 are you all with me so far yes sir okay all right Revelation 1 9 to 23 verses each. Please read, anyone. Sir, Revelation 1, 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and the Pergamum and to Thyatira and, and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Lavadosia. Thank you. Someone else? Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. 
His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Amen. His feet were like fine brass, as it refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. And I have the keys of Hades and of de uh, death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amen. Thank you. So. Let's go from verse 9. Thank you. So John, he says, he's writing to the churches. And of, obviously, these churches know who John is. And it's interesting. He says, I, John, I'm your brother and your companion in the tribulation, meaning at that time, they were going through a lot of persecution. Uh, and it was because of that, John had been banished to the island of Patmos. Right? So he's saying, look, I am also going through all of your sufferings, all the struggles that you're going through. And uh, 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 part of the kingdom and I'm enduring for the sake of Jesus Christ. It is interesting that John refers to himself as your brother. He could have very well said, I'm John, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said that, which, which would be absolutely true. Nothing wrong with it. Paul did introduce himself as an apostle. You know, in his, in his writings, he did introduce him. So not saying anything wrong. But John was, in one sense, in a, he was one of the 12 apostles. With Paul was not. So in that sense, and, and he, you know, and these 12 apostles have a very special place in the New Jerusalem. You will see that in Revelation 21. So John could have, you know, elevated his own status who, uh, as who he was in God's kingdom. I, I, John, and beloved apostle. He could have used the title beloved apostle, but no. It's very interesting. He chooses to use a very simple word. I'm your brother. And I'm also your companion, meaning a, a fellow pilgrim. I'm, I'm with you. I'm journeying with you. So something to keep in mind, if we would like to, is as leaders, Yes, we know God has called us. We know God has anointed us. We know God has given us that place of responsibility and spiritual authority. We are aware of it. I'm not denying it. But we also need to make ourselves on level ground with the people we serve. He said, I'm your brother. I'm your companion. And I'm with you going through what you're going through. Right? Meaning, look, we're, we're making this journey together. I'm not some super special person. No. I'm your brother. We're going together in this. So this beloved apostle of Jesus is just making himself on par, same level, one with all these believers in these seven churches that he is writing to. 
something to keep in mind for us ourselves as leaders that we just come down and you know walk at this level ground with the people we serve or we minister to or are speaking to verse 10 he says I was in the spirit on the Lord's day the Lord's day meaning Sunday so people will ask you know why is Sunday called the Lord's Day. Why is it a special? Because that's that's how the early church saw it. So we continue to you know reference Sunday as the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. So there was a transition from keeping the Sabbath to worshiping on the first day. So the Jewish tradition was keep the Sabbath. They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, which was the seventh day, the last day of the week. The New Testament church moved to keeping or gathering for worship on the first day of the week and Paul writes that and we can see it in his writings and to the Corinthians they moved to the first day of the week mainly that was the resurrection day and so here John is referencing that on the Lord's day so it's okay for us to call Sunday as the Lord's day recognizing he was resurrected on the first day of the week we and that's the day of the week that the early church moved to meet and gather together and worship together right so the lord's day the first day of the week the day of the lord's resurrection so it says on the lord's day he was caught up in the spirit that means his physical body was on the island of at patmos but god took his spirit into heaven into the spiritual realm so this is something you and i uh, are, i'm not saying every all of us are going to experience this but we need to understand this and we need to be aware of what the dynamics are in the spiritual realm so john was taken into the spiritual i was in the spirit on the lord's day and now he's hearing and seeing things in the spirit so he says, verse 10, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So you can, there is sound in the realm of the spirit. I heard a voice like a trumpet. There is direction in the realm of the spirit because he says, I heard behind me. That means there's a sense of direction. There's in front of me there is behind me right so it's not like you're in the spirit realm and everything is like uh hazy and bit direction less no there's a sense of direction in the spiritual realm because he says i heard behind me right so we, we can get some insight you know what the spiritual realm is like we can put these pieces together and we will see more of this as we go through revelation so you can hear sound in the spiritual realm he said I heard a voice and you can have a sense of direction in the spiritual realm now we need to keep in mind that the things John is seeing are things he is not familiar with at all meaning as a human being we are all, we are all as human beings we're all familiar with things we see in our natural world if i say car i say house i say dog i say you know or i say the sound of a dog barking the sound uh, of you know a vehicle or an airplane those are things we are very familiar with in our natural realm but now john has been taken into the spiritual realm he doesn't live in the spiritual realm so he's going to be exposed to things he's unfamiliar with so what's he going to do? He's going to use the language of the natural world to try to communicate to us the unfamiliar things he's hearing and seeing in the spiritual realm. So as far as possible, he will try to correlate things. Example, if he sees something like a star in the spiritual realm, he'll say, yeah, seven stars. See, something like candlestick. Oh, seven candlesticks. 
and the stars, candlesticks are images from our natural world, which John knows. But then he will see things that he may not be familiar with. For example, he sees Jesus on the throne. And he sees his eyes. So he has to think of something in our world to express what he's seeing. His eyes, oh, they're like a flame of fire. That's the best he could use, best language he could use to describe the eyes of the Lord. But remember, he's using language from the natural world, which he's familiar with, to try and express what he is seeing in the spiritual world. So he says, his, uh, his hair was white like wool, meaning there is this whiteness all around him. So he says, it's white like wool. His feet were like fine brass, meaning shining, brass that has been clean and polished. It's like that. And it, as if it's refined in a furnace, pure brass. Right? Uh, so he is using language from our world to somehow express the unfamiliar things he is seeing in the spiritual realm. He, he doesn't see that every day. In fact, he's probably seeing it for the first time. You know, he must be awestruck. And so much so, he says, like, you know, he says, I fell as one who was dead, verse 17. You know, it's like, this is too much for me. I can't take it. He is hearing some, hearing sounds seeing things, and he's feeling in the Spirit. He's so overwhelmed by what he feels. He says, I fell down, verse 17, I fell down like somebody was dead. I'm like, this is too much. Can't take it, can't handle it, can't digest it, can't contain it. So all, all as like, it just drops down to the ground, like, uh, I'm dead, just, I can't handle this. So, the spiritual realm is so real, it's so overwhelming, and there is all these realities. You can see, you can hear, you can feel, there is sense of direction, and there is things that are so unfamiliar to us. The Apostle Paul said, I heard and saw things I cannot even express, I cannot write about. Yeah? Second Corinthians 12, he says, I was caught up into the third heaven. And I, I heard and saw things, I, I, I can't even express it. And John is doing his best here to express in our language the amazing things he is seeing. In the spiritual realm. Now, verse 11, the Lord is giving John instruction. What do you see right in a book? That means this, this entire, everything that's written for us in, in, uh, the book of Revelation, verse chapter 1 to 22, was something God showed John. Most likely, uh, you know, we don't know whether it was one singular experience or whether it was two separate experiences or whether it was more than that. The reason I say two separate experiences is because in chapter 4, verse 1, 
There's once again another where John writes, he says, I heard a voice that said, come up here. And I went, and there was a door that was open to me. So does that mean it was the same experience continuing where God ushers him into, you know, into, into an open door and, and speaks to him? Or is it something that happened on another day? It's not very clear. But let's assume, and I'm saying it's an assumption because we can't say it very definitively. It seems like chapters 1 to 22 was a singular experience. And in that, there's a lot of things he is seeing, hearing, and you know, going on. How much time did it take? We don't know. Was it one hour? Was it five minutes? Was it 20 hours? Where all this is, we don't know. But what we do know is this. After he had that spiritual experience, when he came back into his physical body to sit down and write, that is what the Lord told him, what you see, write in a book. He was able to recall every detail. And there are lots of details in the book of Revelation. So which means this interconnectedness between the spiritual realm and the natural realm is so real that you can be in the spiritual realm, see, experience things, you come back in the natural realm, and whatever you have experienced in the spiritual realm is very, uh, it's retained, and it's very, uh, what to say, you, you can recollect, you can, all those details are still with you. The spirit, carries all this knowledge and is then able to, through the soul and the body, the mind and the emotions, write. That means that's a physical work, right? When, when John sat down to write in a scroll, uh, that was a physical thing. He was doing it in the natural realm. But he had seen everything in the spirit. So the Spirit had the information. The Spirit had seen, heard, felt, got all the knowledge, come back to this body, and now is able to retain all that information. And is through the body, mind and body, he's writing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, what man knows the things of a man, say the spirit of the man who is in him. That means the spirit, the human spirit, is a carrier, is a repository of spiritual information. And from that, the spirit is able to release it through the soul and the body into the natural world. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay. So that was John's experience. And that's what we have recorded for us in Revelation chapters 1 to 22. Let's pause here. I know it's almost uh, break time. We'll pause here. We'll go for a 10 minute break and we'll pick it up pick up and uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time here on this passage and then we'll move forward. So um, let's come back in 10 minutes, please.